Welcome to each one of you. Thank you, Wendell, for those thoughts. Um, I believe that is the the foundation, or the yeah, that's the foundation for the message this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles again to Matthew chapter five. We have finished the Beatitudes, but I I feel like um, God would have me to continue on through the Sermon of the Mount. And so coming to verse 13 this morning of Matthew chapter 5, I say that uh, Wendell's opening was a foundation. You might say, well, what does the, the, the fresh water have to do with salt? Well, I believe it's kneeling and partaking um, from that, that living water that he was talking about that makes us the salt of the earth. So I'd just like to read Matthew 5 verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And we'll stop reading there this morning. Just like to look at this one verse. Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth. He didn't say, Try to be the salt of the earth, or you should be the salt of the earth. He said, You are. Speaking to people who have committed to follow Christ. You know, we just went through the Beatitudes, where it talks about being poor in spirit and mourning for our sins, hungering and thirsting after God. These people are the people that Jesus is talking to when he says, Ye are the salt of the earth. You know, if we haven't experienced that blessedness, in the, list, in the verses uh, before this, then we're not going to be salt either. It just won't work. This, this salt, this attribute of salt, comes from that vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, ye are the salt. So maybe you can help me. What, what do you think of when we talk about salt? What does salt do? It preserves. Some more. Enhances flavor. Enhances flavor. It cleanses. It cleanses. Makes, us Makes us thirsty. Good. Those are all some those are all some good examples of salt. And I believe as we think of salt this morning, those are for, for us, that are some things that we can identify with or we can take lessons from that as we think of Jesus calling us to be the salt of the earth. We are there to preserve, to um, make them thirsty. You know, the, the uh, little quote says, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But then someone else has said, but you can feed him salt. And that's what we're supposed to do. We can't, we can't save the world. We can't make them become Christians. But we can be salt that makes them thirsty for that living water. Thirsty for the living water. For myself, I like visuals. I like to see something that helps me remember things. So this morning I brought along a pinch of salt. Now, some of you recognize that as salt. I don't know if everyone does or not, but that is salt, that is, and it's one of its forms. Who can tell me where you would be most likely to, or what you would most likely use this for? Livestock. Livestock. Okay. So what is the benefit? Just so that uh, their hay tastes better? To bring, enhance the flavor? Okay, makes him drink more water. Yeah, I've, I've seen that happen. 
But also they can, salt contains a, it's, it's something that's necessary for our bodies and it's the same way for livestock. So it's, it's like a vitamin, it's a mineral, it's for the well-being of the animal. So salt actually gives nourishment to the livestock in this case. Here's another form of salt and some of you will, will recognize that. Where would you most likely put that? Yes, put it in the water softener. And as you put that in your water softener, what does the salt do? Okay, okay, yes, yes. The, the term I was thinking of is that it makes the hard water soft. But yes, that was, that was a good answer. It makes the hard water soft. Can we as salt of the earth Purify, cleanse, make soft the hard hearts. And then there's this kind of salt. And where would you find that? On the table. And what's that for? For vitamins? <laughs> Enhance the flavor. Enhance the flavor. All of these are attributes of salt, but it depends on the application on what type of salt. I kind of hate to have this on my kitchen table, and it wouldn't work so well. It wouldn't be very effective. At the same time, I'd hate to use this for my cattle, for my sheep and goats. I don't think they would get much benefit out of it either. But salt has various attributes for various applications, and God is calling us to be salt. He said, ye are the salt of the earth. Going on in this verse, it said, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? The, the Greek word there, moranio, is, is where that term comes from, has lost its savor. And it can mean to become flavorless. It's only used like four times in four different places in the New Testament. And twice Jesus used it when talking about salt. But two other times, it's simply translated as to become a fool, to become simple. So when, when salt loses its flavor, it, it loses its its vigor, its interest, it becomes worthless. The sad part about this, Jesus is saying that there was salt. There was something with meaning and purpose, but it lost its value. It wasn't that it never had opportunity. It had potential, but it lost its value. And it became worthless. It became foolish because... The value that it had, it spurned because of negligence. Salt doesn't easily lose its value. You might say it has to be carelessness in order for it to lose its value. Jesus is warning us that it is possible for us, who are the salt of the earth and have so much good that we should be doing, to simply lose our saltiness, to lose our zeal, to become careless lethargic, and we become fools because we have wasted what God has placed into our care. Those are some things that I think of when I think of salt. Now, I recognize that Jesus used lots of examples when he talked, when he preached, when he taught. And I believe Jesus used examples that were common to the people that they understood very readily. And some of these I understand, but there's some of these, that some of their practices that I don't understand. And I wish I would have a better understanding of their culture so it would bring out so much more meaning in what Jesus is trying to say. Not what he's trying to say, what he is saying. And what I am trying to understand. But this morning I, I did a little bit of study and I'd like to bring out just a few things in their culture that, at least for me, added to the meaning of us being the salt of the earth. 
Because I'm pretty sure that the people understood perfectly. When he, when he said, ye are the salt, it was just like, oh, the light went on. They understood what he was talking about. So in Bible times, salt was very valuable. They couldn't just run to ENS or to Walmart and grab a container of salt. So that was one reason. But also, I think they used salt a lot more than what we do today because they didn't have refrigerators. They needed, some, they needed salt to purify. Neither did they have all the, the cleansing, the, um, you know, all the products to disinfect like we do today. So salt had a lot of value back there, and it was hard to, hard, harder for them to get it than it is for us. There was so much value put on it that sometimes the Roman soldiers were paid part of their salary with salt. And that is very interesting. That was part of their salary. And that's actually where the word salary comes from. It's the allotted allowance of salt that you get each month. And if, you, if you're familiar with Spanish, you would understand it there too. I believe Spanish word for salary is salario. Is that correct, Lowell? Sal is salt. So your salary is the allotted amount of salt that you get for working. And so that's why when someone says that he isn't worth his salt... If he was talking about a soldier, he was a worthless soldier who wasn't even worth what he got paid in salt. In the Old Testament, God puts a lot of emphasis on salt. In Leviticus 2.13, God commanded the Israelites to offer all their offerings with salt. All their offerings that they brought were supposed to be salted And also in that same verse, he mentions that they should not leave the salt out of their covenant with God. And I wish, the Bible doesn't talk a lot about this, about the salting of the offerings and the salt covenant, but there's just a few references made to it. So this morning, I don't don't claim to have all the answers or the explanations, but I was blessed by studying into it, and I am open to it. If someone else has, has some more insights or some corrections afterwards, I would like to hear from you. But here are just some things that, that I learned as I studied it. So it talks about this covenant of salt. and In Numbers 18, 19, God promises to provide for the Levites by the offering of the people. So the Levites were not given land as a possession. But he promises to them that I will provide for you with the offerings that the people bring. Now remember, these offerings were salted. And he says, I am going to provide for you with these offerings. And then he says this. He says, by a statute forever, it is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord. So God is saying, I make a promise by a covenant of salt, that you will be provided for. And there was even a type of that as they brought their offerings and they were salted. So what is the covenant of salt? And why did God require the Israelites to put salt on every offering? You know, I wish the Bible would give a little more of an explanation on this. But some things that we could consider is that salt preserves things. So if there is a covenant of salt, it is something to be preserved, something to last forever. You know, there's something interesting about salt. I could could take salt and put it in my water, and we could stir it up and it would dissolve. But if you would evaporate the water, the salt crystals would still be left behind. Salt remains forever. It does, the essence of salt doesn't change. God was saying a covenant of salt. I don't change. Through the difficult times, through the good times, I don't change. I am always God. I will always provide for you. I am not affected. This promise will not be affected by your surroundings or by the famine or what. My word will stand. It's a covenant of salt. 
God is always faithful. His love endures forever. This is the covenant. This is the commitment that God was making to the children of Israel. And God was asking that same response from them. Bring your offerings with salt. It's a salt covenant. It's a promise. It's a commitment. It's a relationship I want with you forever. A relationship that won't change if things go wrong. You know, if your ungodly neighbors are bowing down to the idols, you'll still bow down to me. Bring your offerings with salt. Also in 2 Chronicles 13.5, it makes reference there to the fact that God gave David kingship over Israel, and then it uses these words, forever by a covenant of salt. Just another example of God's lasting promise. It will not change. It's a covenant of salt. I am told that in Bible times, friendships and loyalties were often sealed with salt. Sometimes they would actually just each partake of salt, but a lot of times they would actually eat a meal that was salted. They would eat it together, and that was a token, that was a covenant of salt, that this will stand forever. I will, be, I will protect you. I will not harm you, or whatever the commitment was. It was a covenant of salt. And interesting to me that even in the late 1970s, when Prime Minister of Israel met with the President of Egypt, as he, as he set foot on Egypt's soil, they greeted and then they stopped, and they took bread and salt, and they partook together. It was a covenant of salt, saying that by the, by the king of Egypt, that as long as you are on my ground, I will protect you. I will not hurt you. I'll, I'll, I'll give my life for your protection. Covenant of salt. Can we understand why God would want a covenant of salt from his people and why he offers it to us? Because God doesn't change. The salt typified that this promise would stand forever. Now I'd like to look at some verses in the New Testament where the Bible talks about salt, there's actually not very many of them. I like to look at, at some of these verses again, now that we talked a little bit of what it might have meant to some of them in the past. So back again to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus says, ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the salt of the earth. As I think of that, the salt in that covenant was the promise that this covenant will stand. And as I am the salt of the earth, God is saying, you are the evidence that I am real. You are the evidence that the gospel works. If you are my child, then you are evidence to the world that things haven't changed. My word will stand forever. I save souls. I redeem lives. And you are the evidence. You are the preserving factor. But then he, sa he says that if the salt has lost its savor, if that salt isn't salty anymore. What good is it? The covenant has been broken. If, if somehow that salt doesn't hold any value anymore, if I have lost my zeal and ambition for God, if my life doesn't show that I've been redeemed, then I've become a fool because I have voided that salt covenant then what value do I have if I don't have salt anymore? Life becomes meaningless. You know, I, as I understand 
as they would gather salt from the Dead Sea, you know, they didn't have the means of storage maybe like we do. So a merchant might gather a bunch of salt and he might put it in a pile maybe in his house or in some kind of protection from the elements. But it sat there in a pile on the dirt floor. And what would happen to that bottom salt that was in direct contact with the dirt? It would spoil because it would pull that moisture up out of the, out of the dirt. And it would spoil. It wasn't good for anything. Now, he could probably scrape that off and try to sell it to, you know, a poor widow lady in the market. But it was worthless. It wasn't fit for that. What value had it? Did it? Would it have? Jesus said it's good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. I believe he, Jesus here was, was speaking maybe of a dual picture here. First of all, thinking of salt. You say, well, why trot it under foot of man? What does he mean by that? If I would have worthless salt, what would I do with it? I wouldn't want it on my garden. I wouldn't want it on my field. I definitely wouldn't use it at my table. I wouldn't use it to cleanse my wounds. Where would I put it? Why? Well, Put it on the driveway. I'd put it on the path, somewhere where it's not going to hurt anything. And I've actually done some of that myself. When there's no proper home, it goes on the driveway sometimes and let it go back to dirt because I sure don't want it spread out in my field. Also, I believe Jesus is saying, when we lose our saltiness, when we lose that relationship with God, we will be cast out. We will no longer have that fellowship with him, but he will have to cast us out because he cannot fellowship with sin. Someone has said, well, let me back up a little bit. So as salt, we're supposed to come into contact with the world, right? How else could we... How else could we touch the world? How else could we affect it? If you don't put the salt in the water softener, it will do no good. You can have a lot of salt shakers on the table, but unless you apply it, it does no good. And so for us as salt, unless we come into contact with the world, we have no value. And yet, thinking of the worthless salt that was down on the dirt at the bottom of the pile, somehow that salt... I guess it had too much contact with sin, and it became worthless. Instead of changing the soil, it became the soil changed it. And that's where I was coming to. Someone has said, the lifeboat belongs in the sea. But once the sea gets into the lifeboat, you've got a big problem. Brothers and sisters, as salt, we need to be out in the world, changing the world, but when the world starts to change us, we've got a big problem. We have lost our saltiness, and we're going to be cast out, Jesus said. Now going to Mark chapter 9. And I would invite you to turn with me there. We're going to look at a number of verses there. Mark 9, Jesus was again talking about salt. <clears throat> and these, these verses, especially verse 49, was pretty confusing to me. As I read them, I thought, what is Jesus trying to say? I don't understand that. I don't understand what he's trying to say there. And yet as I thought, and then as I studied the salt covenant, I thought maybe it brings out a little bit more meaning to what he was trying to say, or what he was saying. So verse 49 and 50 of Mark chapter 9, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, Wherewith will you season it? 
Have salt in yourself and have peace one with another. Okay, remember that every offering that the Israelites brought were to be salted. They were to be seasoned with salt. And, and as every, every time that, that Jew, that Israelite, would bring his offering with salt, it was like a reinstatement of the salt covenant. I'm making this covenant. I will serve you forever. What was the first commandment? What did Jesus say is the first commandment? Yes, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And in some places it mentions strength as well. So as I bring that offering with salt, I am saying, God, you are my God and I will love you with all my heart. Everything that's in me, I love you forever. It's a promise, it's a commitment. Every time they brought that offering, that's what they were saying. They were saying, there, I, I am totally committed to this, to love you with all my heart, soul, and mind. I would rather die than to break this covenant with you. The penalty for breaking a salt covenant was death. Was death. I would rather die than to break this covenant. God would judge, God would punish everyone who would break a salt covenant. And verse 49 says, everyone shall be salted with fire. To me, that's speaking of judgment. And he says, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Now, I would like to go and look at some of the verses prior to this. I'll admit that when I read this first, I thought, what? What is Jesus trying to say? It just seems like a bunch of random thoughts. But as I thought of the offerings and the salt covenant, all at once everything seemed to come together. Let's look at verse 42. Jesus talking about offending a little one. He said, If you cause one of God's children to sin, you have broken covenant with God. And it would be better for you Remember, if you break covenant, there's going to be penalty. And he said, it would be better for you if that big millstone were hung around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea than to break this covenant with God. The suffering, that wouldn't be a pleasant experience, but he said, that would be much better. Then in verse 43, he says, better to cut off your hand if your hand causes you to sin. If you're out stealing or whatever you're doing with your hand, better to cut off that hand than to allow that hand to break covenant with God and to suffer, to suffer the punishment of breaking the salt covenant. Then it, verse 45, the same way with your feet. Cut off your foot. It's a whole lot better than to break the covenant. Verse 47, he addresses the eye. You know, Jesus said, if I use my eye to look lustfully on a woman, I've committed adultery in my heart. It would be better to gouge out the eye than to break that salt covenant with God. You know, for if we have been baptized, we have made, as it were, a salt covenant with God. We have made a promise that I will go through with you. I am committed to serve you for the rest of my life. It's like a salt covenant was in the Bible times. Remember the first promise? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. If my eye, if my foot, my hand, whatever, my mouth, my mind is serving something else. I have broken that covenant. And Jesus said, I'll be cast out. Cast out. Can't have fellowship with God. Eternal torment in hellfire. Jesus said, anything. Take radical measures to keep that covenant. 
You can't afford to break the covenant. Do whatever it takes to find freedom. Verse 50, salt is good. He said, it's good to have salt. It's good to have salt on your sacrifices. Salt is good. But if the salt doesn't have any value, if it doesn't mean anything anymore, you're bringing your offerings with salt. And then you turn around and you go do whatever you want to do. If your salt doesn't have any value, it's worthless. And brothers and sisters, I think we can be guilty of the same thing. We come to church. You know, we say our prayers. But what do we do when we come back out into the world? What do we do Monday morning? Are we still worth our salt? If we have lost our salt, you know, when the pressures come, the difficult times in life, and we face them, if I lose my salt, then it's worthless. It means nothing. And then I like that last part. It's not just a random thought. It says, have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. The first commandment is this, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. And what is the second commandment? Love thy neighbor as thyself. This wasn't a random thought. He says this salt covenant, love God with all your heart. And remember, love your brother. That's part of this covenant. Yes, by this shall all men know that you have that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Have salt. Have salt. Be salty. Have peace one with another. Now going on to Luke 14. Luke 14. Verse 34, salt is good, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And this passage, I find it interesting again. If you look at the preceding verses, I don't think this was a new thought my Bible puts, says that it's a new paragraph, starts a new paragraph in, in verse 34. I don't think it's a new paragraph. It's a continuation of the verses that Jesus had just, the things that Jesus had just spoken. Remember, the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. 26, verse 26, he says, If you love anyone more than me, you're not worthy of me. It's talking about salt covenant. Verse 27, if you aren't willing to carry your cross, you cannot be my disciple. Because you're loving yourself more than you love me. Verse 28 to 32, consider the cost of discipleship. When you bring your offering with salt, think about the promise you're making. Don't just do it carelessly. Think about the promise, the covenant, the baptism, the vows you made when you said you would follow Christ. Consider the cost. And verse 33, if you're not willing to give up everything to follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And then is when 34 comes in. It says, salt is good. Yeah, it's good to bring salt on your offerings. It's good to make this covenant with me. But if it doesn't have its value anymore, what good does it do? What good does it do to go to church? If you don't have value, if you don't have that salt when you touch the world, what good does it do? Then it says it's neither fit for the land. 
Now, I don't usually think of salt being good for the land. But as I understand the salt, like coming off of the Dead Sea, it actually had some fertilizer value if it was used in the right proportion. Um, maybe not what I would want to use today, but for an organic fertilizer, it actually had some value if the right amount was put on there. But he said, if it's lost its value, it's not even good for the land. Definitely not for the table. It's not even good for the land. Not even for the dunghill. And I don't know what all, how all the things happen in their culture. But someone thought it might have looked like this. That out on the back edge of their property was probably the place where they used the restroom. And when they were done, they would sprinkle some salt over it for a disinfectant, to kill germs, to whatever, take odor down. I don't know. Whatever the case, Jesus said it, even, it has no value even for the dunghill. A salt that has lost its flavor serves no purpose but to be cast out. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter where we started out at. It doesn't matter how rich a heritage we have. If we lose our zeal for God and we become lukewarm, God says, like he said to the churches in Revelation, I'll spew you out of my mouth. We have lost our purpose in life. We serve no value. We will be cast out, out on the street, because they can't find a better place and will be trodden under foot of men. Yes, and in the end, it'll be worse than the street. It'll be eternal hellfire. Then he, get just, he, he just clinches it with a final warning. He says, if you have ears, listen. Listen. He said, I'm giving you a warning. I'm giving you an opportunity. I, I believe Jesus, as he looked over the audience, he saw, he saw those Pharisees. He saw those people that would faithfully bring their offerings and they'd put lots of salt on them. He says, no. I'm warning you, that salt has no value if you don't have that relationship with God. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. Speech that is loyal, trustworthy, speech that preserves, promotes healing, Speech that cleanses and disinfects the wounds of sin. You know, I had to think of our memory verse, the adult memory verse this morning, James 5.20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way hath saved a soul from hell and covered a multitude of sins. Now that is salt, brothers. That is salt to convert a sinner from the error of his way. And to cover a multitude of sins. I don't think that means that I'm, I'm going to try to hide sins so nobody sees. No, that means that if, I, if the sinner is converted from the error of his way, his sins are cleansed, they're covered by the blood of Jesus, and it's all taken care of. That is salt. That's what God's asking of you and me this morning. But if we want to make a difference... We have, to con we have to make contact with the world. You know, there's a lot of illustrations we could bring out of here, and we don't have time to do that this morning. There is one concern I have about this big block, and I'll just, I'll just throw it out there and let you think about it. There is, there is value in this thing. There is a right place for this. But if you look at all the salt that's there and how little contact it has with the environment around it, there's a problem there. And I, I just put a warning out there that if, we, if our focus is on number and size, we might get our size, but we might miss the content. You know, the salt that's in the inside of this block, the only exposure it has is to its brothers and sisters around it. It really can't make any difference. And sometimes when we get a big pile of salt, 
we start focusing on each other instead of on the environment around us. But wherever God has called us to be, if you are, God has given, given you a big block, then use it. Whatever form God has given you, to use it to the best of your ability. Be salt. Touch your environment. Make a difference. You know, if, if you have not made friends and neighbors thirsty for Christ, you probably are not the salt of the earth. If you have a reputation for making wounds more than you have of healing wounds, you are not the salt of the earth. If your life has given someone a bad taste for Christianity, you probably are not the salt of the earth. Are you making a difference? Salt does make a difference. If I'm not making a difference, then I'm probably not a child. I'm not a child of God. If I'm not making a difference, if I'm not making a positive influence on the world around me, then I'm not a child of God. So I just want to close yet with Jesus' words. Have salt in, your, have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Let's kneel for prayer. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the examples that Jesus has given us that we can understand. I thank you for these types, these examples that help us to understand how we should live. And also that help us to understand the loyalty, the everlasting love that you have for us. That your covenant does not change. And your promises never fail. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Father, just take these words. Bless them as you see fit to the needs of, in our lives. And as we go from this place, help us to be more effective in reaching out, being a witness, showing the world that your salvation really works, your plan of redemption is still available to all men. We pray this.